But you mentioned your background and how you have grown. And can you explain to us, at one point, you were pretty comfortable in with intelligent design. And, and that was when you were still, were, yep. were you going for your doctorate at that time? Yeah, I was a brand new graduate student. I had just started my PhD in cell biology and genetics. Yeah, and I, I became aware of the intelligent design movement around that time. And I read uh, a book by Michael Behe called Darwin's Black Box. And I thought it amazing. It's like, oh, of course, there's all this stuff that's so complex. There's no way that natural processes could produce them. We see irreducible complexity. Yeah, it's just a no-brainer, obviously. This is, this is the way to go. And I sort of camped there for a while. I didn't do a lot of interaction with origins issues while I was doing my PhD. I kind of just shelved it. But I was still working from that basic assumption that, you know, evolution is something that's anti-Christian. And ID seemed a really good place to kind of hang my hat during that time. Then, so I stayed that way through my PhD, graduated, got the job here at Trinity Western, taught from an ID perspective for a couple of years here at Trinity. And then I was asked to do, um, to help rewrite an article, a book chapter actually, about biology and Christianity. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to have anything too intelligent to say on this, I better do a whole bunch of reading. And it was during the process of that uh, research for that article that I changed my views. But I actually started with intelligent design again at that point. Uh, Behe had a new book out at that point called The Edge of Evolution. And I thought this would be a fantastic spot for me to sort of pick up again with ID because I was thinking I was going to write the paper from an ID perspective. And I really wish I could have had a video camera sitting here in this office right here at this desk reading the opening chapter of Edge of Evolution. And I can remember myself just kind of thinking, what on earth am I reading? So I have two experiences of reading intelligent design material. I, my first experience was reading it um, as basically a, a brand new graduate student. So I had my bachelor's in biology. It sounded great, sounded convincing. And then I had the experience of reading the same author, a different book, but the same author, um, after I had completed my PhD and I had, you know, taught for a couple of years. Um, so I was a, you know, a PhD biologist at this point. And I was amazed at the, the difference that that made. I was, I can remember, you know, sort of every so often as I'm reading through the book, kind of like exclaiming out loud, just that, you know, this, this was very poor argumentation and that this wasn't credible. And I can remember I got at, to a certain point and I'd put the book down. And it's just like, I can't go any further at this point. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm not ID because if that's ID, my goodness, it, it doesn't, it doesn't hold up. So the next article or the next thing on the reading stack was um, the nature paper that discusses the human genome as it's compared to the chimpanzee genome because the chimpanzee genome had recently been sequenced. So I'm like, okay, I'll read this next. And reading that paper, I was just blown away by the difference with what I was reading from ID compared to reading genuine science. And I read, th I read through that paper and I was like, wow, there is no reasonable way to claim that humans and chimpanzees do not share a common ancestor. So I, I, at that point, I'm like, okay, I'm not ID. I don't know what I am. But and, I mean, I knew about Francis Collins at that point. His book was farther down the reading stack. So, but even in that day, I lost, you know, lost my faith in ID, as it were, even before I decided to, you know, to sort of build something else. I knew that ID wasn't going to work for me anymore because of the poor argumentation I was seeing. I'm going to jump in one more and then I'm going to come back to you, Christine. But De Dennis, you said you lost your faith in ID. <laughs> How many Christians do you know go through the same process you did and actually end up losing their faith uh, mm. in, in their deconstruction? And what would you recommend maybe for parents who are listening or for, for those college students who are listening who think that the only alternative is, well, this I thought this was true, it's not, so I guess I must be an agnostic or an atheist. Yeah, a big, and this sort of gets back to what I was saying about with students that I have that struggle with these issues. If you've been raised in an, in an environment that repeatedly tells you, you can either accept the Bible or evolution, but that they're mutually incompatible. Well, then what, what happens when you 
gain scientific expertise and you see the evidence for evolution firsthand from that position of being able to understand it, it forces students into this awful choice. So what's needed is earlier, I mean, you know, a parent nowadays, you know, you can't go back in time, but, you know, for parents, say, if your kids are younger right now, begin to talk to them about how there's a range of views that some Christians think evolution is okay. They don't see it as a threat to their faith. They see it as God's intended mechanism for bringing about biodiversity. You know, there's a long conversation within Christianity about Genesis and how Genesis should be interpreted. The literal interpretation of Genesis that's popular now in certain circles is a relatively recent innovation. If you go back to the patristic period, for example, you won't find that kind of literal interpretation. You know, all of those sorts of things are very helpful for students when they're trying to unpack, you know, as they're processing. But for some students, it really is too much of a shift. They have built so much of their faith on this foundation of a particular view of biblical inerrancy, a particular particular interpretation of the early chapters of Genesis that they just they just can't see how these things go together it's just too foreign to them so yeah you know say for a parent who has a child who's walked away from the faith like what would you do now well maybe do some reading yourself find out about Christians who accept evolution who think science is you know good science is important but also think that good biblical interpretation is important do some reading yourself and then maybe reach out to your child and say, you know, I've been doing some reading. I've changed my views a bit. You might find this helpful. I've, I've seen that occur with some parents in the past, but I've also seen that some some kids at that point, you know, adult children, they're like, yeah, no, mom, dad, I'm, I'm done with it. It doesn't work for me anymore. A part of that, too, is the unfortunate sort of culture situatedness of Christianity, especially as I in the States. Uh, Canada has this, too, to a certain degree. But we don't tend to parcel issues together in the same way. So we don't think you have to vote a certain way if you're a Christian. We don't think you have to have, you know, certain views on, say, firearms rights if you're a Christian, those kind of things. So it can sometimes be harder for someone to unpackage Jesus from all of those other things that tend to get added on.